Hello everyone and thank you for joining. Today we're going to talk about integration. I'm going to try to cover all the basic concept about integration. So if you're just starting out with integration, I think this will be a great video for you to get familiar with the concepts. I'm not going to go too depth into all the terminologies, but the idea is that you'll be more familiar with integration and will be able to learn more from here. I will not be showing hands-on activities from Salesforce, so we're going to stick to this PowerPoint today. Before we get into today's video, I wanted to announce about my GoFundMe page. Please check out the link for more details. Uh, the mission is to empower one girl pay for her school fees and I will be doubling the donation. So the goal is $1,000 and I'll be adding $1,000 more. Um, I would really appreciate if you can share this with your friends and family and any donation that you can support will be really helpful. Thank you. So what is integration? Integration in a very simple term is basically two or more systems communicating with each other and exchanging the information that they need that they already didn't have. After getting the information, the system that actually requested the information can do whatever they want with the information. Maybe you may want to just store the information into your uh, native system or just view them uh, for the end user. So you can do whatever you want with that information. Uh, that's really up to the developer and the business requirement. So why do we care about integration? Now Salesforce is a great platform, but it obviously does not have all the functionalities in the world. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel anytime we are asking or we need some information. So we basically use all these third party systems that are already available for us to use. All you need to do is pass some information and then you get the data that you need in a very simple fashion. So you can focus your time and energy in the logic. Here is an example. Let's say you have a bank application or bank loan system. And before you actually approve somebody's loan application, you want to get their credit score. Now, in this case, let's say I'm here. This is Salesforce. I entered the user's or customer's name information like social security number, but I need the credit status. Now, let's say if these two systems were not connected, I would have to open Salesforce in one tab and I would have to open any credit software on the second tab. So I'm already juggling two applications now. Then I'll take the social security number from Salesforce because that's where I'm storing my information. I'll go to other system, enter that information, and then it will show me the credit status. But wouldn't it be great if I can just do that from Salesforce itself without having to use the other application? And that's where integration comes in. Like you can literally have something built in. It will You can click a button, it will make that call from the background and show the credit status on the Salesforce page. That is the power of integration. And it can be other things like uh, maybe you are building a really fancy app where the moment you put in the address, it will show you all the nearby locations or something like that, or nearby restaurants. You can integrate then that to Google API, which will then get the information based on Google Maps. So there are so many examples out there and so many APIs for you to use. Which brings me to the next topic, which is API. You may have heard the word API a lot, and basically the full form of API is application programming interface. But what does that really mean though? It is like an agent to communicate within system. Um, all the systems talk to each other through API, and there are different types of API protocols. Um, SOAP, REST, WebSocket, don't worry about what is SOAP and REST and WebSocket at this point. Just know that um, mostly we use REST these days and event-based um, protocol to communicate with different systems. So these are just different types. So imagine there are different languages in this world and just different ways of communication. So in the same way, even in the web world, we have different protocols to talk within different systems. Some systems prefer one uh, protocol versus the other. And that is why there are different types of protocols based on the API you are going to use. So what do API do and why are they useful? So APIs basically take care of all the complex logics for you, gather all the information from different sources in the web, and so that you can focus on one API call and get that information from this third party. Of course, they will charge you for that based on the API you are using. If you're using Google API, there is certain charge for that based on how many information you need from that particular API per day or depends on the API that you're using, there will be some charge. Um, but essentially, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can just get whatever you need just making one call to this API. 
as an example, let's say you were a order company, somebody ordered from your company, you wanted to send a text message to the people. Now imagine if there was nothing, no API to do that, you would have to actually communicate with every service provider, like AT&T, Verizon, Google Fi, you'd have to communicate with everyone and then send the text messages based on that. But there is an API for that Twilio, which actually takes care of all that for you, then all you need to do is connect to one application and they will send the information based on the phone number provided. API is basically taking all this business log, just simplifying it so you can focus on your particular business use case and not having to worry about all this extra information. Another example is um, of using an API is when you log into some platform, it will you'll see an option log in through Facebook or log in through Google. And you just click on that and it takes you to that platform, even though that application has no idea of your Google and Facebook password, but still knows who you are. So that is happening because of the API that they use to build their application. They're only using Google to authenticate you inside the platform, but then they're not storing the password and username. So you don't have to worry about making user password for every systems that you have. So that's another advantage of API. And there are so many APIs out there. Now, APIs can either consume functionality, which we have seen examples of, or also expose functionality, which a lot of developers do. So you can build an API and then expose it to a different system as well. More examples, just Google Maps, API Stripe, um, Twilio, Evlar, Attacks, Salesforce obviously is also an API. Now, okay, so far we talked about general integration and API terminology. Now let's talk about Salesforce in specifically. You have process integration, data integration, and virtual. So process integration is just the name suggests. It's more process oriented. So let's say if you, um, if you are in a sales process and uh, somebody ordered something, you need to send that order to a third party system. That is basically a process integration because that integration happens within a process. Data integration is more like if you have to integrate data from a different warehouse into Salesforce or maybe send data from Salesforce to a different system in bulk in a regular basis. That's a data integration. Virtual is integration, but you're not really entering data into Salesforce, you're just showing it inside Salesforce window. So it's virtually integrated, but in reality, data doesn't stay in Salesforce, but it is still a form of integration, so virtual integration. Now let's like look at more details and different integration patterns within Salesforce. Now, don't be scared with this slide. Um, there are a lot of information here, but if you really think about it, it just comes down to a um, few basic things. So here's the main thing that you need to worry about for integration. Context, problem, forces, solution, sketch. So what is the context of integration, right? Who is calling which system? What is the problem we are trying to solve? What are the limitations or forces, meaning uh, what are the different system limitations, data limitations? What are the things you need to be worried about? Solution, obviously, is what is your solution. Sketches are really important in integration. So before you even start building anything, that's, it requires thorough analysis, sketches, whiteboard sessions to get to what actually needs to be integrated. And then you have other things to worry about. And this is where you spend a lot of time is on results because building an integration is pretty quick and straightforward. But a lot of time is spent on uh, error handling, what happens if the integration doesn't go through, who gets email, um, and lots of testing. So there are six main integration patterns in Salesforce. You don't have to memorize them, but just understand each concept and what they mean. And I will share the link so you can actually go to the documentation if you're really interested in reading in more detail. Here we're going to cover high level. So request and reply is you're making a call and you're waiting for the response back because you need to do something with that information. In this case, I'm Picking an example of you are on a phone call with a customer and they need to know their status. Let's say in this case, Salesforce does not have any idea of what the order status is. But they can, you know that there is a button you can click that will make a call to FedEx API um, by passing the order number and then you'll get back a response, which is basically will say whether it's um, in progress or shipped or whatever it might be or delivered. So 
that status can be displayed on Salesforce page. Now, what you do with that information is totally up to the business requirement. Maybe they want to later save that status in Salesforce on a record, that's fine. But in this case, we are not concerned about that business requirement, but know that this is synchronous process, meaning you are waiting for the response and you cannot move forward until you get the response back. So this is remote process invocation, request and reply. Now, the tools or mechanism that you'll use for this may vary depending on the third party, what APIs you have to work with and other technical um, limitations of the third party that you are working with. You may use a flow, basically a flow button that can call the third party and make a request using Apex classes or Apex action within the flow. That is one way to do it. Um, and Salesforce rec recommends using non-code approach first, then you can go for coded if that does not meet your needs. Remote process invocation, fire and forget. So like the name suggests, fire and forget. Now this is asynchronous in nature. Asynchronous basically can happen in the background. So let's say um, you can, your use case is you're closing an order in Salesforce. Maybe you're closing an opportunity. It creates an order, then you accepted the order. Now, once the order is accepted, what needs to happen, it, it needs to alert your order management system. Your order management system can request, receive the request and maybe alert their shipping team or whoever needs to then process the order and deliver it to the customer. Now, in this case, you are not necessarily waiting for that order to be processed. You don't need to do anything. Like your job is done the moment you accepted the order, that's it. You don't care about what happens it will do its thing in the background. So that's asynchronous process. And like before we can do coded or no coded approach. You can also use something like platform events where you basically publish an event. Once that order is processed, then the third party can listen in for that event and do their uh, processing. That's one approach you can take. Or if the third party does not support listening in for the event, um, it can be a regular integration with Salesforce making the call and then third parties doing their processing. So again, not to get too technical there, but um, this is important distinction is asynchronous versus synchronous process here. And after the order is processed in the different system, it can also come back with an order number or maybe an order status and update something in Salesforce. So that will be from third party to Salesforce. We'll look at that example in a bit. So batch data synchronization, this is when we talked about it is a data integration, so not really a process, but some data integration needs to happen whether overnight or maybe based on what data changed in Salesforce. So one use case I have here is you need to sync a provider database from a third party into Salesforce nightly basis. So you're a health provider, healthcare provider, and you need to update um, the doctors and practitioners information in Salesforce from an external data source on a nightly basis. So you can go about this by using a third party uh, ETL tool, which is basically just, you will have a batch job schedule to run every night. And this is not the Salesforce batch, it's uh, something on a third party, like a Boomi or MuleSoft can do this. Um, if you are sending information from Salesforce to outside, you may wanna also do change data capture where it's only sending the information that changed as opposed to sending everything every night. Remote call-in. So in the previous example where um, the order information was sent to the third party and the third party now wants to send it back to Salesforce, that is a remote call-in for Salesforce perspective. That's a remote call-in. Basically, a third party is calling into Salesforce to maybe update that order field um, or ID on the Salesforce side or something like that. And here, um, there are various mechanisms to do that. It can also become um, REST API call-in or WSTL. Um, creating a WSTL is pretty straightforward. You need you can generate WSTL and provide it to the developers of that third party, maybe NetSuite or any other systems that you're working with. And they can then code that um, API and make a call into Salesforce. So as a Salesforce, you really don't need to do much about um, coding that third party, but you can provide them and help them uh, getting that information that they need. And that's mostly where you will be supporting 
um, the third party in figuring out how to connect to Salesforce using remote call-in. They can also do event-based, um, something we already talked about. Next one, UI update based on data changes. So in this case, the data is actually constantly updated without you even having to refresh the screen. So let's say you are on a phone call with a customer who is making a payment and you want to make sure that the customer actually paid and you don't want to refresh the screen. Maybe you may lose some information. In this case, you Salesforce can, you can make a push into Salesforce using streaming API and it will automatically refresh the screen without you having to do anything. I don't have experience with streaming API, but uh, there is a really good trailhead that you can learn if you are more interested about this topic. Data virtualization, as we mentioned earlier, this is another type of integration where data doesn't necessarily need to be in Salesforce, but you can still access the information as needed by the end user. So Lightning Connect is a good example where you can create external objects to view the data in, in other systems in real time. Um, UI mashups, as in like creating iframe and displaying that in Salesforce, maybe a Google Maps, or some other information that you need without having the data in Salesforce. Canvas app is another one where you can build applications in a different language, but still expose that into Salesforce um, framework. So really good examples of virtualization. One uh, quick note about integration in general is whenever you're working with integration, keep in mind that you have to be very closely working with the third party API. So sometimes uh, the support with the API can be really good where you can get on a call with a third party and talk through their documentation and how to access the API and so on. Sometimes you may not be so lucky and you may have to rely just doing a lot of research on that particular API because the complexity of the project may depend on the type of API you're using and the type of support. And you will spend a lot of time reading the documentation of these third parties that you're using uh, to consume their APIs because every API is different. but and you will need to get the access, login access and authentication and so on to connect to those APIs. So spend enough time with that. And if you're not getting this in the first go, that's fine because every API can be different. So keep that in mind as you get into these projects. I hope this was helpful and wasn't too overwhelming. I tried to keep it high level, but at the same time, give you enough information that you need if you get into integration projects, the questions you need to be asking. Thank you so much for watching.